Chapter 4.10 looks at how visual art can be used to explore, reinforce, and challenge various expectations of personal identity. Um, this includes things like gender, race, sexuality, um, ethnicity or cultural heritage, and much more. One obvious way that an artist can explore their own personal identity is through self-portraits. Now, of course, in self-portraits, the maker and the subject are the same person, whereas in a regular portrait, the artist depicts someone else. Um, self-portraits are a great way to explore um, the physical likeness or the sort of external appearance of the artist, but they can also tell us something about the artist's personality, their experiences, and their choices. Um, and it can help the artist to better understand themselves and to grapple with ideas such as um, their own mortality. Um, the complexity of a self-portrait is really linked to the fact that the artist and the subject are the same person. During the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe, portraiture was growing in popularity, and self-portraits were often used to reflect the artist's increasingly elevated role in society. Um, here we have a self-portrait. Um, this is one of many created by the German artist Albert Durer. Um, this one includes an inscription to the right of the figure here that says, Thus I, Albert Durer of Nuremberg, made an image of myself in appropriate colors in my 28th year. Um, and then on the opposite side of the figure, we see his monogram A with a D inside and the date 1500. Um, he's shown himself in a sort of rigid frontal view. There seems to be uh, an emphasis on the hands and his eyes, um, which are perhaps the two primary tools of the artist here. There's not a lot of emotional expression in his face. He's very um, sort of stoic and reserved, um, but he makes a very intense eye contact with the viewer. So Durer, he was originally from Nuremberg, Germany, and he was a very skilled painter, printmaker, goldsmith. He made stained glass as well. Um, he was interested in the humanities and the relationship between art and science. Um, Durer traveled pretty widely to study art and culture, um, including to Italy, which really helps to expand the theoretical and intellectual languages used by Northern European artists. Um, so in the North, we've already seen a couple examples of Northern Renaissance painting um, with their interest in detail and clarity. But we can also tell that Durer has studied in Italy or in the South um, in this picture. So notice he has um, sort of soft, curly hair, um, a fur collared cloak, um, highly detailed and very illusionistic uh, surface textures here to imply a sense of reality. Those are Northern Renaissance characteristics, but he's also rendered his own face using um, the gradation of light and shadow or that chiaroscuro that the Italian Renaissance painters developed. Um, he reveals his skin tone and texture, the individual hairs growing from his beard or even in his eyebrows. Notice too the amount of detail in the hands. You can see sort of the wrinkles on his fingers and the pores and kind of lines in the skin on the back of his hand. Um, just a lot of attention to very minute naturalistic detail. Um, and then also notice this is an oil on canvas and so you can really see the um, the qualities of oil paint here as he's built this portrait up using layers and layers of thin glazes to create this very luminous kind of um, glowing portrait that has this very lifelike quality to it. Um, like at any moment, this figure might blink or move um, and interact with us further.
Now, I mentioned this rigid frontal view. This is a position that was traditionally reserved for iconic images of Jesus Christ. Um, and so Albert Durer has possibly adapted this uh, pose as sort of a reference to images of Christ. Maybe he's trying to illustrate the idea that we as human beings are meant to imitate Christ in our lives um, because man is made in God's image. Or perhaps he is emphasizing the importance of the artist as a sort of divinely inspired creator with exceptional God-given talents. Um, it also seemingly makes a claim that artists are not simply just skilled craftsmen, but learned and creative geniuses. So this is very confident and um, a way for the artist to sort of grapple with his own identity as a professional artist within this time period. The Dutch artist Rembrandt von Rijn, who was born in 1606 and died in about 1669, also made several portraits throughout his career, um, more than 90 of them to be exact. Um, these two are from later in his career, from 1658 and 1659, respectively. Um, in both, we can really see his mastery of oil paint as a medium. We're, we're seeing um, a rich sort of luminous painterly surface. Um, you can see um, some indication of a sort of loose gestural brush stroke. He's really utilizing um, chiaroscuro to model the face and the figure here and create a sense of volume or three dimensionality. Um, and then he's also incorporated some tenebrism, some of that extreme kind of um, extremely dark shadows in the background and then how that contrasts with the sort of spotlight that sits on the figure and makes the figure appear as if they are sort of dramatically emerging out of the shadows. Um, notice, too, that um, within the cheeks of the figures, especially the one um, in the portrait on the right of the screen here, um, on his cheeks and sort of in his nose, we see this very soft tint of red, um, sort of a blush to his cheeks and his face there, indicating, you know, blood flowing under the skin and sort of bringing this figure to life. And I think in both portraits here, there's such a an attention given to the eyes, there's really a sense of, um, you know, quiet, contemplative intensity at the same time, though. Um, there's sort of a, an intelligence, but also a tiredness within his eyes and his expression. Um, so he's really, you know, he's showing himself in this sort of relaxed, um, yet regal pose and really demonstrating a high level of sensitivity toward the human condition. Now, it's interesting to know that in 1656, so not very long before these two self-portraits were created, um, Rembrandt actually declared bankruptcy. He sold his art collection and his house. And so if you notice here with those gestural brush strokes, especially on the portrait on the left side here around the hands of the figure. It seems to imply maybe a sense of tension. And then again, that um, tiredness or weariness in the eyes. Maybe this is meant to reflect the stress that he was under during this time of um, financial, I don't know, turmoil. Um, there's also a sense of extreme realism because he's showing us um, his aging, sagging face. We can sort of see the wrinkles and the lines in his skin, um, especially under the eyes and around the mouth. Um, we can see sort of the furrowing of the brow between his two eyebrows here. He seems, again, tired and perhaps worried, and yet he's someone who has suffered and still survived with at least a majority of his dignity. Another kind of self-portraiture involves the artist assuming the role or persona of someone else. Um, sort of similar to how an actor would portray another person uh, in a film or on the stage. Um, many artists, including Rembrandt, have been very inventive with their self-portraits to the point where the connection between the work or the image and the artist is not always uh, obvious to the viewer.
in many of Rembrandt's self-portraits, he shows himself in various guises or disguises, um, from peasants to aristocrats. And these often demonstrate his interest in exploring different facial expressions and different character types. Um, so here we have a self-portrait from a bit earlier in his career. This is his self-portrait with Saskia in the scene of the prodigal son in the tavern. So here Rembrandt appears as the prodigal son from the biblical story of the young man who rebels against his father's wishes by spending all of his inheritance money. Um, and so Rembrandt has taken on this persona or this character and created a very lively mood within this tavern scene. He's shown himself um, raising a glass towards the viewer as if in toast and the barmaid Saskia um, is sort of seated, seated, excuse me, within his lap, looking on um, at these activities. The barmaid Saskia was also modeled after Rembrandt's wife, um, and so that helps to make this into a more sort of personal self-portrait. Egon Schiele was an Austrian expressionist painter who was born in 1890 and died in 1918. His works were known for their intensity and often for their raw sensuality and sexuality. He typically included distorted, twisted figures, and he's also known for his many self-portraits, including several self-portraits um, that are nude, including this particular one from 1911. Like many of his other self-portraits, this one is searing and psychologically complex. He depicts himself as an emaciated, tortured figure of the artist, and he's bony and quite angular. Um, the portrait is really bristling with this sort of inner tension, and that is made visible by the agitated pencil lines and then the painted white aura around the figure. Notice his facial expression. We have these large, dark eyes glaring out at us. Um, his mouth is open and his hair sort of stands on end. Um, it's quite unnerving in some ways. Um, and then with the arm sort of jutted out at the strange angle, he takes on a pose that is perhaps somewhat suggestive of um, a figure of Christ on the cross during the crucifixion. Um, He's limited his color palette to um, sort of a neutral, I don't know, selection with shades of brown. And in certain areas of the body are tinted red. Um, he's really challenging the viewer with physical and psychological torment. Notice that, um, again, he's emaciated. He looks to be beaten or bruised. And he doesn't have any hands and he doesn't have any genitalia. Um, it's possible that the lack of hands and genitalia is symbolic. Um, he is perhaps expressing uncertainty about his own body and his own sexuality. Um, and perhaps he's taken away these body parts as some sort of self-punishment for masturbation, which at this point in time was thought to lead a person to insanity. Now, I believe Egon Schiele, when he was young, um, his father was very sick from syphilis and eventually he died from the disease. And so watching his father go through that experience sort of um, affected the ways in which he viewed his own sexuality. And I think it really had a kind of traumatizing effect on him. Here we have another from just a few years later. Um, this is Schiele's self-portrait with a Chinese lantern plant. Um, he would have been about 22 um, at the time this was painted. He sort of squeezed his own figure into this horizontal format. He's cropped off um, a good portion of his hair and sort of um, his torso maybe right at the mid chest. His head sort of tilts to the right, but his eyes look to the left. And that sort of creates this sense of tension, perhaps, um, this sort of conflict. He's both confident and fragile, some sort of at the same time. 
Um, the lantern plant in the background, it sort of echoes his tilted head, while the shoulders then create some contrast um, by sort of uh, intersecting with those lines. He's really depicting himself in this self-portrait as a sensitive artist, and that was a role that he sort of relished, this idea of the tortured, creative soul. In fact, um, the same year he painted this, he wrote a letter to his mother in which he said, I shall be the fruit which will leave eternal vitality behind, even after its decay. How great must your joy therefore be to have given birth to me. Mexican artist Frida Kahlo was born in 1907 and died in 1954. Her artworks tend to be powerful autobiographical explorations of identity. Her self-portraits, which comprise a one-third of her total artistic output, combine a relatively naturalistic depiction of her outward appearance and often graphic depictions of her chronic physical and psychological suffering with metaphorical references to her feelings, personal experiences, relationships, her mixed cultural heritage, and more. Throughout her life, Frida Kahlo suffered severe chronic illness and pain. Um, many researchers now believe that she was born with a spina bifida, which is a medical condition that affects the development of the spinal column. Um, at the age of six, she suffered polio, which permanently damaged her right leg and caused lifelong pain and weakness. Um, then, at the age of 18, she was involved in a bus accident in which her right leg and foot were crushed, her ribs, collarbone, and spine were broken, and her abdomen and uterus were pierced with an iron handrail. Um, after as many as 35 surgeries in a three-month recovery period, she experienced severe lifelong pain and underwent several additional operations. Um, she periodically had to wear plaster corsets to help heal her spine, and she was often confined to her bed. Um, these persistent medical issues and the accident also impacted her fertility and resulted in multiple miscarriages. Now, during the initial recovery after the accident, her father brought her art supplies and she began painting. She had a special easel installed that allowed her to paint in bed and a mirror hung above it that allowed her to see herself. Painting proved to be an effective outlet for representing her experiences with these physical, mental and emotional traumas. Um, she also explored her own ideas of feminism, womanhood and cultural heritage and developed her own personal philosophy and sense of identity. Uh, she said, quote, I paint myself because I am so often alone and because I am the subject I know best. This work titled The Two Fridas from 1939 is a large scale double self portrait. Two versions of the artist identical except for their outfits, are seated on a bench in front of a stormy sky. They hold hands and gaze out stoically at the viewer. Now the use of a double self-portrait here is interesting and it could have several metaphorical interpretations. The most overt connection perhaps is to the mirror that she had installed over her bed that allowed her to paint herself during her recovery and bouts of illness. But the double portrait also calls attention to her complex cultural identity as a woman of mixed Mexican and German Jewish heritage. Now, additionally, in 1929, at the age of 22, Frida Kahlo married the acclaimed Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, who was 42 at the time. Now, prior to their marriage, she typically wore the modern European dresses and styles of the era. But upon Rivera's encouragement to embrace her Mexican heritage, she adopted more traditional Mexican attire. So the use of two figures here allows the artist to address these two distinct aspects of her identity. The Frida on the left wears a contemporary European gown reflecting her father's German roots and the styles that she wore in her earlier life.
The Frida on the right wears a traditional Mexican skirt and blouse, reflecting her mother's heritage and the styles that she embraced after her marriage to Rivera. As in many of her works, human anatomy is graphically depicted here with the two vulnerable exposed hearts, one of which is further ripped open. This presentation emphasizes the sensitive emotional content of the painting. Uh, Frida Kahlo often used a blood as a visceral metaphor of union. And so the two figures here, they're not only holding hands, but they are also further connected by a common artery that stretches between their two hearts. Um, perhaps this represents the literal mixture of Mexican and European bloodlines within her veins, or maybe it symbolizes a newfound unity between the two halves of her cultural identity. It's also significant to note here that the year she painted this canvas is the same year that Callot divorced Rivera, and the exposed hearts and arteries are indicative of her feelings of sadness and vulnerability at the time. On the right, the artery wrapping around traditional Frida's arm feeds into a miniature portrait of Rivera, which indicates that part of her still pines for her lost love. On the left, modern Frida clamps down on the vein with a hemostat, figuratively severing her connection to him and literally stopping the bleeding. She has been hurt and that cannot be undone as evidenced by the bright red blood that stains her white dress, marring its symbolic innocence. But she is strong and she is resilient and she will get through this. Callot's 1944 self-portrait titled The Broken Column is perhaps one of her most powerful and emotionally charged works. It serves as a clear metaphor of the physical and emotional pain that she experienced throughout her life and as a testament to her strength and resiliency. Callot's figure fills the majority of the composition, and while her facial expression is once again stoic, her eyes, which are emphasized by her darkened monobrow, express her suffering and tears spill onto her cheeks. Her lower body is covered with a flowing white sheet while her torso is naked. Nails pierce her skin and her body is cracked open, revealing that her spinal column has been replaced with a Greek ionic column, which has often been considered the feminine architectural order. The column is ancient and ideal, but crumbling and no longer effective in supporting her body, symbolizing the physical and emotional pain she suffered, specifically her continuous back pain and the repeated spinal surgeries that she underwent to try and alleviate some of that pain. Her body, like the column, is broken, held together with bandages and braces and sheer willpower, resulting in a rigid, upright posture that, in combination with her controlled facial expression, conveys this idea that Kolo is a strong, resolute woman, while still acknowledging her pain, her vulnerability, and her fragility. Kolo's artworks were also deeply political and feminist, and this one is no exception. The painting can be seen as a commentary on the way women's bodies and emotions have often um, been considered secondary to the nation's needs during the era. Um, her nudity and the vulnerability that it represents show the sacrifice and strength of women. Um, and at the time that this work was created, Mexico was also experiencing a growing sense of nationalism and anti-colonial sentiments. And so many have interpreted the broken column as not only a metaphor for the physical and emotional pain that the artist suffered, but also as a symbol of the crumbling of Mexico's past and a desire to rebuild a stronger and more unified nation. American artist Robert Maplethorpe was born in 1946 and died in 1989. Um, he used his lifestyle as a gay man as inspiration for his photographs. And so the issue of gender affects his imagery quite a lot. He often chose subjects that were highly sexualized or related to his experiences as a gay man in America. Um, his photos are very carefully composed, a very elegantly lit and sort of technically perfect. And he makes his subjects, um, which might have previously been seen as deviant, appear normal and even beautiful. Um, 
there was a natch excuse me a national controversy that was sparked by an exhibition of Maplethorpe's works um, that traveled to several different museums across the United States shortly after the artist died of an AIDS related illness in the late 1980s. Um, some museum officials and politicians considered the graphic sexual nature of some of Maplethorpe's photographs to be problematic because the artist had been awarded a grant from public funds. Um, but Maplethorpe didn't see a significant difference between a flower, a classical sculpture, or a nude male figure. And so his nonconformist view also carries over into um, the ways in which he defined his own personal identity. And that becomes evident here in this self-portrait. Um, this is one of many self-portraits that he took um, during his career, but here he's shown um, with his hair curled and he's wearing eyeshadow, blush, and lipstick. He's sort of playing with different aspects of his identity um, and playing with the ideas of gender and sexuality. He is raising questions about the assumptions we make based on the way people look. Um, and he's also sort of revealing the degree to which gender is a social construct and making an argument that not all people fit into the conventional distinctions of male and female. American photographer Cindy Sherman, born in 1954, allies photography and performance into a postmodern critique of society and an exploration of identity. In her acclaimed untitled film stills series, she casts herself in an endless variety of female roles. These inexhaustibly inventive photographs are like one frame movies with props, lighting, costumes, makeup, wigs, and a script. And the result is a set of intriguing visual puzzles that challenge the viewer to find the real Cindy Sherman. But the goal here was never to conventionally represent her own identity. And Sherman has explained that these images are not about her, but about the representations of the women being shown and the ways that each viewer interprets them. The series seeks to subvert the stereotypical roles women have often been limited to using fabricated backdrops and costumes for imagined characters from non-existent 1950s and 60s films, TV, and commercials. In untitled film still number 21, Sherman assumes the role of a small town or country girl coming to the big city for the first time. She's young and beautiful and presumably naive. Something off screen has caught her attention, but her expression tells us that she's not quite sure about it or not quite comfortable with it. And so the scene becomes somewhat ominous. In untitled film still number 10, the artist appears as a young, fashionable woman who kneels in a kitchen to pick up various items while glaring up at an unseen onlooker. Here she's perhaps thinking about the power of visual representations or appearances to construct female identity and how femininity is often performative, something that women feel they must wear like a costume. Now, this is perhaps somewhat ironic because in many of these film stills, the character the artist portrays is really sort of ultra feminine. But she's also maybe saying that by masquerading, identity is not necessarily fixed and that can be liberating. In untitled film still number 35, we see a woman wearing a dress and apron with a bandana tied in her hair. Maybe she's meant to be a housewife or a maid. Her hand is on her hip and she glares over her shoulder with a serious attitude, but the context is ambiguous. She stands near the door facing towards the wall where jackets are hanging. Is she about to take a jacket off the wall and storm out? Is she pouting or sulking about something? There are a lot of scuff marks on the door and on the wall. Does that indicate some sort of violence, perhaps? 
For this particular photo, Sherman says that she was thinking of a film titled Two Women, in which Italian film actress Sophia Loren plays a peasant. Her husband is killed, and she and her daughter are both raped. In the film, Loren is a tough, strong woman, but she's all beaten up and dirty. And that combination is what Sherman has tried to recreate here. In Untitled number 30, we have a much clearer scene of domestic violence, although the perpetrator isn't in view. Instead, Sherman focuses on the vulnerability and the emotionality of the battered woman. Sherman's Untitled Film Stills series was created between 1977 and 1980 and includes a total of 69 images. The women in all of these seem as if they're being watched, the object of some unseen voyeur's gaze. And so these images call attention to and question the ways that we look at women. Sherman has continually explored these ideas throughout her career. In 1980 to 1982, she produced a similar series, but this time in color and in near life-size dimensions. Here, she explored women's roles in more recent B-movies, particularly horror movies, and the idea of the male gaze. And she used projected backgrounds in completely internal spaces, um, and she depicted scenes of lonely women who are seemingly not allowed out outside. Um, here she tried to focus on more um, specific emotional moments rather than implying fuller situations or scenarios. And the results are very psychological and dramatic. Um, we get these sort of spotlit scenes of terrified women who seem to have, you know, just horrified expressions or maybe even vacant shocked expressions um, that sort of reference the vulnerability and the trauma that women often experience. Personal identity affects everyone on some level, but it really became a central issue for artists in the late 20th century. At this time, many long marginalized or oppressed groups began celebrating difference. Um, they began to take pride in being part of non-white ethnic minorities, to take pride in being female, being gay, trans, being black or Hispanic. Um, and so we start to see artists really exploring various aspects of their personal identity in new, more direct ways. In her 1963 book titled The Feminine Mystique, author Betty Friedan explains that fulfillment as a woman had only one definition for American women after 1949, and that was the housewife mother. Um, but in the 1960s and 70s, the women's liberation movement called for greater recognition of women, both past and present. Feminist artists started to use a variety of art forms, including conceptual and performance works, to escape the male-dominated traditional art forms of painting and sculpture. And they also used imagery of female anatomy, menstruation, and reproduction to represent women's experiences and to critique the social, political, and historical oppression of women. In the late 60s and early 70s, um, feminist artists Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro founded the first feminist art program at Cal Arts. Chicago and Shapiro and 21 female art students went on to create Woman House, a collaborative art environment in an empty Victorian mansion. They renovated the mansion and filled it with feminist installations and performances, and they tried to um, sort of challenge the meaning of the room or the activity that takes place within the room and how that relates to a woman's self-image and sort of examine the relationship between biology and social or gender roles. Visitors to Woman House encountered a variety of installations and performances. They would have seen Faith Wilding's Womb Room, which consisted of crocheted webs that draped the room from floor to ceiling. And they would have stopped in the bright pink installation Nurturant Kitchen, created by um, Vicki Hodgetts, Robin Welch, and Susan Frazier, which featured 
um, fake fried eggs that hang from the ceiling and the wall. And as we move from the ceiling down the wall toward the floor, the eggs morph into breasts. Visitors also would have encountered Sandra Orgel's linen closet in which she has installed a female mannequin physically into a linen closet so that her body is oppressively interrupted at the neck, chest, and torso by the shelves. And in Judy Chicago's installation, Menstruation Bathroom, a trash bin overflowed with bloody pads, drenched Kotex liners hung from a clothesline, and used tampons were strung about, among other shock-inducing menstrual paraphernalia. Judy Chicago, as well as many other feminist artists in the 1960s and 70s, often incorporated what she referred to as core female imagery. Essentially, this imagery was abstracted from um, the form of female genitalia. This is sort of essentialist in that it focuses on the biological aspects of womanhood and the differences women have physically from men. But Chicago used this core female imagery as a way to challenge the male dominated art world and society and to sort of assert the value of female experience. Um, Sexual difference had so long been used to exclude women and label them as inferior to men, and Judy Chicago instead wanted to celebrate what made women different. She envisioned these core forms of female imagery as, yes, abstractions of the vulva, but also as butterfly forms, um, symbols of liberation. She says, I want to make butterfly images that are hard, strong, soft, passive, opaque, transparent, all different states. And I want them to all have vaginas and all at the same time be shells, flowers, flesh, and forest. After Woman House, realizing how many women had been forgotten or omitted from history, Judy Chicago embarked on another huge installation project. Um, this was called The Dinner Party. This is a mixed media installation that was dedicated to rescuing hundreds of women and female artists from the anonymity of history. It consists of three large tables, each 48 feet long, arranged into an equilateral triangle. Now the equilateral triangle is an ancient symbol of equality and fairness, but it's also an ancient symbol for um, femininity and for female goddesses. Um, each table features 13 place settings for a total of 39. Um, and each place setting represents a different woman, real or mythological, from various eras throughout history. Now, each side of the table has 13 place settings, which is the number of men who were in attendance at the Last Supper and the number of witches in a coven. Along the floor, an additional 999 women's names are inscribed in gold on the white tiles. Each place setting of the dinner party consists of an embroidered placemat that features the name of a famous historical or mythological woman and a ceramic plate designed using core female imagery um, to reflect that woman's identity and her time period. Now, this was a collaborative project. Judy Chicago worked with um, numerous women artists and volunteers. I believe there are about 400 total volunteers, um, most of them women, but a handful of men as well. And it took five years from 1974 to 1979 to complete this work. Um, they used traditionally feminine arts, including China painting on ceramic plates and um, fiber arts like embroidery and sewing. Um, this project was meant to elevate women and their experiences and their histories, the materials and art making practices that they have used historically and sort of um, educate the public about these women and kind of bring their appreciation to a new level. Um, so here we have two examples from the dinner party. We have the Emily Dickinson and Georgia O'Keeffe place setting. 
Here are a couple more. Um, these are the Artemisia Gentileschi and the Hatshepsut place settings. And then here we have a place setting for the mythical fertile goddess, a prehistoric mother goddess. Um, this place setting is interesting, particularly the embroidery that was done here. So for each setting, um, the placemats, the artists wanted to use materials and techniques that would have been used by the woman of the corresponding area. Um, so how would a prehistoric woman gone about uh, creating a textile or a placemat? Um, well, they did research and um, determined that a woman would have made her own needles out of animal bones and then used those um, to sew her textile with. And most textiles during the prehistoric era would have been made out of um, relatively rough spun wool threads. Um, and so a certain group of volunteers set about trying to recreate this process. They first um, attempted to use the carcass of a deer that they had acquired, but when they went to um, retrieve the hide and the bones, they found that the, the carcass was infested with maggots, and so they tossed that idea and started over. Um, ultimately, they ended up um, getting some cow's bones from a local butcher, I believe, and they boiled those down and whittled them into bone needles. And then they spun, um, using traditional sort of techniques, their own wool thread and used that to create this textile, this placemat. And then you can also see they've incorporated the bone needles into the decoration, and they've incorporated other small um, sort of um, ornamentations, including a small ceramic figurine that sort of mimics uh, the woman of Willendorf and other prehistoric female figurines that we were looking at a few days ago. In the late 20th century, other artists started um, addressing racial and ethnic differences. Now, around this time, it would have been 100 years post the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation. African Americans were still experiencing significant discrimination, segregation, disenfranchisement, oppression, and violence throughout the United States. Uh, Faith Ringgold was an African American artist born in 1930. She was an abstract expressionist painter in the 50s, um, and then she became very inspired by both the feminist movements and the civil rights movement. Um, so this work from 1967 is titled The Flag is Bleeding, and it's part of a series of about 20 paintings that sort of focus on racial tensions of the time. We see a black man, a white man, and a white woman depicted in front of, but also covered by, the American flag. And they are linking arms with one another. Um, the flag, again, is sort of superimposed over those figures, and then the red stripes uh, sort of bleed and drip downwards over the figures as well. The black man holds a knife in one hand, um, the hand that is looped through the arm of the white woman beside him. And then his other hand covers his heart as if he is um, pledging his allegiance to the flag, but simultaneously that hand is covering a bleeding stab wound in his chest. Um, he, the black man, is fighting for his freedom, his humanity, his life, but the white woman and white man are unscathed living the American dream, sort of oblivious to the um, violence and the tragedy that he is experiencing. Faith Ringgold said of this time, we thought of the American flag as our symbol of freedom, but we were losing our freedoms in the 60s. All of the blood lying all over the sidewalk and nothing about it in the papers. I mean, silence, like it hadn't even happened. Um, and so many of her works you know, reference this time period and they explore Jim Crow and civil rights, the assassination of MLK, um, various race riots, the idea of black pride or black power and the politics of skin color, but also ideas about women's rights, um, reformation of the prison system and her own personal experiences as a black woman in the 1960s in America. 
Howardina Pindell was born in Philadelphia in 1943. She grew up in the lawfully segregated South, but racism was rampant nationwide. Um, she was 21 years old when the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. Now, this particular work is a video work titled Free, White, and 21 from 1980. Um, this film, it's a short film, I believe the total was about 12 minutes, um, but it developed out of her own need to heal and to vent. Um, she was involved in an accident around this time, and she said, my work in the studio after the accident helped me to reconstruct missing fragments from the past. In the tape, I was bristling at the women's movement as well as the art world and some of the usual offensive encounters that were heaped on top of the racism of my profession. And so Free White and 21 is sort of a deadpan account of the racism that she experienced coming of age as a black woman in America during this time. Um, it illustrates um, a very stark divide between black and white Americans. The artist appears as both herself and in costume as a white woman. The video opens with glancing shots of the artist in white face wearing a blonde wig in the guise of a white woman from the 1950s or 60s. This character is the free white 21 year old to which the title refers and she appears throughout the video discounting Pendel's searing experiences with statements like you really must be paranoid or you won't exist until we validate you. As herself, Pendel first recounts the abusive racism that her mother endured and talks viewers through the milestones of her own life, including elementary and high school, college and young adulthood, uh, via the discrimination that made her advancement such a struggle. At one point, she peels a translucent film off her face as if to reference the facial masks and other cosmetic products that are marketed towards women to beautify and transform their looks. Um, the film serves to reemphasize that the fact, um, or excuse me, the fact that the artist's skin, her looks, and her blackness were transformed into a liability by dominated American society. Howardina Pindell credits both the women's liberation movements and the civil rights movements with helping her to discover her own voice. She said, I developed a number of tools for inward looking personal assessment through the women's movements consciousness raising processes in order to understand how racism and sexism work within the art community as well as within the community at large. I found my true voice through the African American movement, but received my training wheels in the women's movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. African American artist Carrie Mae Weems um, uses her own persona as a black woman to respond to a number of issues, including women's subjectivity and their capacity to revel within their own bodies and their construction of their own self image and self identity. Um, but she also explores other issues of race and gender and class as well. Um, this particular image is titled, well, it's untitled, but the subtitle, Woman and Daughter with Makeup, is from her Kitchen Table series from the 1990s. Um, this series shows the artist or the protagonist inhabiting the same domestic space throughout the entire series. Um, she is anchored to this wooden table illuminated by an overhead light, and she is shown um, with this rotating cast of characters, including her friends, her family members, her children, her daughter in this case, and there are various props that are used as well. Um, so here we have a female character sitting at the kitchen table with a young girl, presumably her daughter. They both gaze into mirrors at their own reflections and apply lipstick in parallel gestures. The photograph here is meant to show that gender is a learned performance. At the same time, it tenderly centers black women as its subject. 
In her 1995 work, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried, Weems reveals how photography has played a key role throughout history in shaping and supporting racism, stereotyping, and social injustice. This installation is comprised of appropriated photographs of slaves in the American South and other 19th and 20th century photos of Africans and African Americans that the artists found in museums and university archives. Uh, from the photographs she selected, um, she used various daguerreotypes which were commissioned in 1850 by the Swiss naturalist Luis Agassiz, who traveled throughout the American South with a photographer taking portraits of slaves. Agassiz intended to use these portraits as visual evidence to support his theories about racial inferiority of Africans and to prepare a taxonomy of physical types within the slave population population. Weems says that when we're looking at these images, we're looking at the ways in which Anglo America or white America saw itself in relationship to the black subject. I wanted to intervene in that by giving a voice to a subject that historically has had no voice. So she took these um, 19th and 20th century photos and re-photographed them and enlarged the images. She printed them through blue and red colored filters and framed the red tone prints in circular mats, which are meant to sort of suggest the lens of a camera. She placed all the prints beneath glass and sandblasted various uh, choices of text onto the surface. Um, about her choice of text, the artist has said, I'm trying to heighten a kind of critical awareness around the way in which these photographs are intended. She hopes this strategy, quote, gives the subject another level of humanity and another level of dignity that was originally missing in the photograph. Adrian Piper is another African-American artist who uses her works to embrace her ethnicity and her cultural heritage and to challenge the ways in which black people have been treated within American society. So she's African-American, but she's quite light-skinned, and so most people assume that she is white, and throughout her life she has often encountered very racist comments um, because white people have assumed they are making a comment to another white person. Not that that makes it okay, but they um, don't realize that they're speaking to someone that they are, you know, directly offending. Um, and so she began this, this series of performances. My calling card, this one is number one for dinners and cocktail parties. Um, and she performs these by handing the card out to a person after they've made a racist comment. And so she's sort of directly confronting not only racism, but ideas of racial passing um, and making the racist commenter feel a similar level of discomfort that she feels because of their comment. Um, so here we have a card that says, Dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you made slash laughed at slash agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I have attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks even when they believe there are no black people present and to distribute this card when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. Kara Walker is an African-American artist who's best known for her um, cut paper silhouettes that address the overlooked histories of the pre-Civil War South. Um, she often critiques historical narratives of slavery as well as the ongoing perpetuation of racial stereotyping. She hijacks these racial stereotypes to show the violence and oppression that occurred during the pre-Civil War South and she pushes these rather derogatory caricatures to absurd limits. Um, here we're looking at a work titled Insurrection, Our Tools Were Rudimentary Yet We Pressed On, which references a slave revolt. Um, we see various characters, including a woman on the back wall who's shown um, fleeing with a noose still dangling from her neck. 
on the right wall, we have a group near the corner, um, a group of slaves up at the big house leaning over the body of their master whom they have just killed and disemboweled. Um, another woman, again on the right wall, but sort of toward the middle, is shown straddling a man and tearing off his head. Um, so she's examining this sort of desperation of these black people during the time, um, the oppression that they experience, the corruption of power that um, white slave owners demonstrated, um, the ideas of human bondage, the violence and the revenge that occurred. And so as you view this work and kind of move around the room, your shadow is cast upon the wall and therefore you become part of the scene and you have to consider which side are you on? In 2014, Carol Walker was commissioned to create this large-scale installation titled A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby inside the Domino Sugar Factory in Williamsburg. Um, now this factory was set to be demolished um, shortly thereafter, so this was not a permanent installation. Um, but this factory in the 1890s, it produced half of all sugar consumed in the United States, and it was described as perpetual torture to have worked there. Um, so this installation was meant to be an homage to, quote, the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world. Um, so Walker is thinking about the ways in which Africans and African Americans have been oppressed and forced into slavery throughout history, thinking about how um, especially you know, with the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in the United States, um, Africans often were put to work on um, sugarcane farms or made to work in sugar plantations, uh, perhaps like this one in Williamsburg. Um, but she's also referencing the larger cultural oppression of Africans um, with the form of the sphinx here in the large figure at the center. Uh, and so with this sphinx, she's referencing how Egyptian or African slaves were the ones who built the pyramids. But she's also crossed this form of the sphinx with um, a sort of stereotypical caricature of um, a black woman. She's sort of mimicking the Aunt Jemima character or the mammy figure here um, to comment on the ways in which black women have been sort of mythologized and sexualized um, throughout history. She's in a very provocative sort of sexual position. She has enlarged breasts, um, a prominent rear end, and sort of large pouty lips. Um, She's also thinking, you know, about the problematic nature of the sugarcane industry in general. Again, slaves working on sugar plantations, but also producing treats and luxuries for the white population. So the term subtlety refers to a sculpted sweet made out of sugar and marzipan that was made for the aristocracy and the nobility um, in the 17th, 18th centuries. Um, these subtleties were symbols of power. Um, and the processes that are involved in sugar production, the refining of sugar, they literally turn the product from brown to white. So there is this, you know, literal process of whitewashing happening in this plant as well. So the artwork, you know, it consists of this large scale female figure made out of 35 tons of sugar and 15 processional figures which are cast in sugar and then coated in a molasses resin that carry baskets of these sugar subtleties and drip molasses throughout the space. So the installation is sort of responding to not only the building's history but a much larger and a much deeper reaching problematic history. Um, I included a short video about this installation on Blackboard um, if you're interested and want to see more. 
So we've already sort of seen how art can be used as a very powerful vehicle for telling stories about both personal and cultural identity. Um, so here we have another great example. This artist is James Luna. Um, he is of mixed Mexican American and Native American heritage. And he uses performance art as a way to bring cultural conceptions to light in simultaneously humorous and serious ways. Um, this particular work is titled The Artifact Piece. He first performed this in 1987 at the Museum of Man in San Diego, which is an ethnographic museum rather than an art museum. Um, and so in this work, as well as many of his others, he asks viewers to confront the stereotypes that they have about Native Americans. So here he lays almost completely naked within a display case inside the museum. Um, it's filled with sand and other artifacts from his life, such as favorite, um, some of his favorite books, his favorite music or personal papers. And then museum style labels um, point out various marks or scars on his body. And so he's turning himself into this living ethnographic object for people to sort of ogle or judge. He's objectifying himself to challenge the prejudices and highlight the role that um, museums and other institutions play in the perpetuation of these stereotypes. He is actively embracing his cultural heritage and challenging the ways that people view that heritage. In his performance, Take a Picture with a Real Indian, um, first conceived in the 1990s, um, James Luna dons a, quote, traditional native outfit and stands stoically posing for snapshots with tourists to call attention to, again, the stereotypical perceptions that people have about Native Americans. Um, so in the photos from 1991, you can see these various representations of Luna and how, um, you know, he has donned this traditional or expected outfit of a Native American chief um, and juxtapose that next to himself wearing sort of modern or contemporary clothing. Um, the image on the right was taken on Columbus Day, October 11th, 2010 at Union Station in Washington, D.C. Um, and so this was a performance of this particular work in which he, you know, stood out in front of the Columbus Monument and took pictures with tourists. Um, he said that the performance lasted until he felt, quote, mad enough or humiliated enough. Um, he said that this is sort of a form of dual humiliation. Um, the interactions that he has between, or excuse me, with the tourists may seem sort of lively and fun, but they are meant to contrast the viewer's simplistic preconceptions with his embodied reality as a living person. And he hopes that this will leave people with an understanding that cultural identity is not a joke and neither are the stereotypes. Jane Quick to See Smith is another Native American artist who takes on a lot of issues within her works. Um, she tackles things like tribal and community affiliations and racial stereotypes, um, but she also pulls from her own Native identity and addresses myths of her ancestors in contexts of current issues. Um, she's interested in educating the public about and preserving Native American culture, and she's also interested in environmental activism, consumerism, mass media, as well as other things. Um, <clears throat> so this particular work is titled Trade, Gifts for Trading Land with White People from 1992. Um, and so this work was a reaction to the celebration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing and the beginning of the mistreatment of Native Americans. She's also referencing this allegorical story about how Dutch colonists acquired the island of Manhattan from Native Americans in exchange for about six 60 guilders worth of goods, which today would be about $24 worth of stuff. 
Um, now, this is probably somewhat exaggerated, but the existence of this story implies that Native Americans were pretty frequently tricked out of their lands by cheap goods. Um, so the surface of this composition has been collaged with generalized depictions of nation people. Um, there are newspaper articles about native life, photos, comics, tobacco wrappers and chewing gum wrappers, advertisements, images of deer and buffalo and native men in traditional dress. And then she has incorporated a sort of expressionist application of paint and this uh, sort of superimposed ghostly outline of a Native American canoe. Across the top of the composition, we have all of these hanging objects. This is a collection of stereotypical commercial images um, that sort of appropriate images of Native Americans and Native culture um, to sell goods. Um, we've got things like hats with images of sports mascots and again wrappers from food or gum and tobacco. We have Native American dolls and other objects. And so by incorporating these things the artist is sort of reversing that historic sale of land for goods and really trying to emphasize how Native culture has been commodified. And of course, we also see artists who use their works to explore the topic of gender or identity and its relationship to sexuality. Diane Arbus is an American photographer known for her photographs of marginalized people. She was very interested in and celebrated um, gender and gender identity. Um, so here we see two works on the left, Two Friends at Home in New York City from 1965 depicts a couple in their domestic setting, um, sort of creating this intimate portrait that is suggestive of the nature of their relationship. Um, Arbus's direct images tend to convey a sense of trust between the sitter and the artist, and they're strikingly and often brutal portraits of inner emotion. Um, she says, there are and have been and will be an infinite number of things on earth. Individuals all different, all wanting different things, all looking different. Everything that has been on earth has been different from every other thing. And this is what I love, the differences, the uniqueness of all things and the importance of life. I see something that seems wonderful. I see the divineness in ordinary things. Catherine Opie also uses photography to investigate the nuances of gender and identity. Um, early series like Being and Having from 1991 or her Portraits series from 1993 to 97 depict friends in lesbian and gay communities in LA. Um, and they sort of mix traditional portraiture with less traditional subjects. Um, and in her domestic series, she traveled across the United States to photograph lesbian couples in their everyday settings. Again, using a sort of traditional portrait photography with more non-traditional subjects. Um, so here we see Melissa and Lake from Durham, North Carolina in 1998. Um, the couple, they look somewhat fam um, similar to one another, but the focus is on their bond, their relationship, not their appearance. And really it's not even about their gender or their sexual identity, just the connection between two human beings. And so portraits like these introduce many viewers to new ways of life or cause viewers to consider familiar people or things in new or different ways. We previously discussed the impact of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s on various artists and we looked at a few examples of artists who adapted activist strategies to sort of educate the public and call for action. But there were other artists who were more inspired by personal suffering and loss who created works to confront human emotions like grief, anger, love and hope.
Um, so here we have two works by Felix Gonzalez Torres. He was born in 1957 and he died in 1996 of an AIDS-related illness. Um, he was a minimalist artist, so he's interested in sparsity, um, but he infuses that sparsity with a sort of deep personal meaning and includes uh, sort of intense statements about human mortality. Um, so we have Untitled Lover Boy on the left and Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA on the right. Um, so these are both referencing uh, Gonzalez Torres's longtime partner, Ross Laycock, who at the time was dying of AIDS. On the left, the stack of pale blue um, napkins or papers on the gallery floor was left with instructions for visitors to take a napkin with them, and so as they do so, the stack disappears. Um, on the right, we have a pile of individually wrapped candies weighing about 175 pounds, which would have been Ross's ideal healthy weight. Again, viewers were invited to take a piece of candy from the pile as they moved through the gallery, and so the pile slowly disappears. In both of these works, um, we have a sort of allegory for the slow disappearance of Ross's body as he succumbs to this disease. By involving the viewer, he's really transformed these works of personal and individual loss into political acts that call attention to the social impact of the AIDS crisis and serve as a memorial for those who were lost to the disease. And um, they sort of serve as a way to help people who are impacted by these events and by this disease cope with their own loss or with their own experiences and sort of embrace their own um, identities in the face of such uh, devastating adversity or um, experiences. So since the 1990s, the art world has mirrored the increasing interest in multiplicity or the connectivity of a global culture. Um, so one artist who uh, exemplifies these ideas of multiplicity or connectivity is Winda Gu. Um, he was born in 1955, and he studied traditional Chinese ink painting at China's National Academy of Fine Arts. In 1992, he began his ongoing United Nations series, which now consists of more than 20 monuments. Um, this series is meant to highlight the histories and traditions of particular countries and regions of the world. And for these works, he collected hair from barber shops and hairdressers around the world. He weaves that hair into textiles with lace-like patterns and pseudo characters that are based on Chinese, English, Hindi and Arabic scripts. Um, so the, the text in these works, it seems legible, but it's not. It's totally made up. And so he takes these textiles and sort of transforms them from traditional Chinese scrolls into an installation. He creates spaces with hanging and draping panels, um, these curtains of hair that sort of surround a meditation area that features video monitors and chairs um, and projections of the sky and the clouds and sort of a soft calming music uh, played with ancient Chinese bells. Here are a couple close-up shots so you can sort of see the details of these textiles and really see that they are in fact made out of real human hair. So here we have another example of one of these monuments. This one is his Babel of the Millennium from 1999. Uh, for this work, he visited 325 different shops in 18 different countries, and he created 100 or more panels of hair textiles that are each about 75 feet long. And so for these works, he is really exploring ideas of connection, of um, communication, globalization, and how universal qualities like hair can tie us together, but language and culture can be somewhat of a barrier. So he's sort of challenging viewers to try and understand each other's lives and cultures 
um, without, you know, bickering, without fighting, and truly asking us to accept one another for who we are as individuals. Lastly, we have Angelica Doss's Human A Project. This is an ongoing project um, that consists of the artist taking more than 3,000 portraits in an attempt to capture every shade of the human skin tone. Um, Doss says that she doesn't think she'll ever actually accomplish this. However, she's already come much farther than any other person in cataloging just how diverse the spectrum of human skin colors is. Um, she sort of describes this as a chromatic inventory. So she takes a portrait of the sitter with a blank background and then takes samples of their skin tone using Photoshop to create a background that matches their skin tone. Um, she spent over three years shooting portraits in over 19 cities around the globe. Um, she said that her goal was to create a discussion platform about identity and to be a way of subverting our normal codes and to really have us think, or excuse me, rethink the diversity of humanity. Now these portraits are framed from the shoulder up and the sitter does not wear any clothing that might act as an indicator of class or culture. She generally leaves out all references to nationality, origin, economic status, age, etc. And she's quite careful when she um, arranges these compositions to avoid setting them up in a spectrum of light to dark. She's really trying to draw an awareness of how often cultures or societies rely on binaries, on things like black and white or male and female. And she's really trying to encourage her viewers to think more in terms of multiplicities.